I started looking up the the lyrics to Word Up, <laughs> and she said it wasn't that kind of cameo. <laughs> Y'all old pretty lean. <laughs> <laughs> when you practice, you might as well get it out. <laughs> I'm putting that in. My goodness. <sighs> oh, oh, you okay? All right. Hi, welcome to Fiber Love Diary. I'm Trish if we haven't met and if we have met welcome back we are going to do a Q&A today I'm gonna pick fleece today while we do it I have quite an amount to pick so um, we'll get to it what it is and what's going on with it it's part of the question so it works out really well I have six pages of questions this time and as you guys know I do tend to ramble sometimes and maybe describe or explain more than I need to so Hopefully you'll just grab a project and then hang out with me. We'll just pretend we're like crafting together while I do this <laughs> Q&A. That's okay. Uh, the very first question is for John. So he actually came in and he's going to come and answer that question for us and then we'll move on. So this is my cameo <laughs> on the question and answer period. <laughs> is it nerve wracking to be on YouTube? It still feels weird. Okay. So the question was from Kate. John did the purple, orange, pink one over three pans, but why the yellow first? Was that a prep thing, a color consideration? Well, when I do braids, I don't worry so much about having undyed fiber in there because when you spin it, it all kind of gets mixed in and changes the colors anyway. But when I'm doing yarn, when you're knitting a sock, you don't want to have a big undyed section in there. And I wasn't sure that maybe you've noticed this. Uh, sometimes I don't get enough dye in the pan. I wanted to make sure that there was color on everything first before I added my primary colors, just to make sure you didn't have white blotches in your socks. Okay, so I'm back. And I'm gonna answer the next question. It's from Karen R. It says, the yarns are beautiful. They look so different in the finished skeins. Do you rewind your skeins to mix them up a bit? I think it gives a better idea of how they will look when knit. Thank you for a fun video. I have not done it every time, but I do like it better and I agree that's the reason. I think it looks more like it will look when it's knitted or woven. So I, I, it's kind of a pain for me to do because I have to use my, um, my Nitty Knotty and put the hank on my Swift. I used to have two Swifts and then I could just go from one to the other and rewind it in a different width or diameter or whatever, but I gave one away. It sounds like it shouldn't be a big deal, but 400 yards over, you know, five different hanks is kind of a big deal. Probably not something that I can feasibly do for every hank, but for photos, I do like to do it if I can. Brittany asked, she said, love watching your dye videos. Out of curiosity, how long did it take to dye all those hanks from start to finish? I don't time us. I actually don't know how long we were there. I'm gonna guess it was like an hour and a half. That does not include the time that they're heating because I have a timer on my heating set up and so I can like leave it on low and just leave. So it doesn't include that and it doesn't include the soaking time from the beginning. Sarah Kulikowski asked, she said, I've been looking for a simple beginner sock pattern. I can knit, but only barely. The socks you made for John look like something I might be able to handle. Did you make those from a pattern or have you been making socks long enough that you can just hand, hand wave? <laughs> Um, I that is how I do it now I have kind of a plain sock formula is how I think of it that I can use to fit anyone's feet pretty much I did link Sarah to a vanilla sock pattern on Ravelry I will link it below um, just in case anybody else is like hey I just want to knit a sock that is just very basic and get started out I mean I think for really bright colored yarns and variegated ones that have a lot of contrast I very I frequently like a sock that is just completely vanilla because it really sets the yarn off I've talked about this before but I kind of feel like 
I've seen a lot of people doing pattern socks with patterned or variegated yarns where I feel like you lose something when you do it. You lose some of the beautiful yarn and you use some of the appreciation of the beautiful pattern or both. For me, I usually prefer to just focus on one thing or the other. Once in a while, you do find a combo that's just perfect to set off both the yarn and the pattern, but I think a lot of times for me, I just end up focusing on one or the other. Marina said, I love this. This is the, the rug video that just came out like two weeks ago. Um, I love this and want to make a rug. First, I had to learn how to warp my new to me Harris loom. What is that white material tied to front warping beam and why do you have it? So it was, it came with my loom, which was used, but it's just like an apron that if you have ever woven on a rigid heddle or on a different kind of floor loom, normally after you tie on and you start winding your material onto the front beam, you would cover up the knots where you tied on because they will stretch and poke up into the fabric and you don't want that usually. So most people cover it with some stiff paper or whatever. That white, very heavy canvas uh, will do the same thing basically. So that's what it's for. It came on my loom and I'm very thankful for it. I love that. Erin, oh Erin, I'm gonna get something to show you guys. Erin said, do you ever have moths try to eat your wool? You live in a cold area. I live in Louisiana, so it may be different. I'm just curious how other than mothballs because they stick, do I ward them off? I'm gonna show you what I do. I've talked about this before. I've gotten questions about it. We still do get wool moths here and we get all the other kinds too, like pantry moths. We just get everything here just like you guys do. But let me go grab what I use and I'll show you because I think it's a good thing to tell everybody about. Hang on, I'll be right back. All right, this is what I use. It says moth trap and it says natural moth pheromones sticky trap. Okay, so it's for wool moths specifically. It also says made in Germany and non-toxic and odorless. This hangs in my studio all the time. There is a sticky, I'm not gonna touch it, but if I touch the back of this, there is a super sticky piece of adhesive, whatever, along the back through all these holes. You can see there are no moths in here, right? This has been up in my studio for, it's March, so five months. And so I don't have a problem, but they do get in and once in a blue moon, I'll find one on here. I've seen people say they don't want these because it will attract moths and it, will it actually draw them into your house if you don't like already have them because it's, it's giving off pheromones. So it only attracts the males. And if you already know how this works, you probably, most of you probably do. The real problem is the females because the females come in, they lay eggs in your wool items or wherever, and then the eggs hatch and the larva is what actually eats and damages your items. That's why sometimes you find casings from larva or dead larva around the holes, but you almost never find actual moths where they've been eating and damaging. It's the larva. So if you take males out of the equation, you stop that life cycle. Even if the males were drawn into your house, they can't do anything on their own to damage your wool. And if you remove them from the life cycle, they can't impregnate or fertilize the eggs of the females so that you don't get larva. So that's what I use. I get them on Amazon. It's probably time for me to hang up a new one. Um, I'm trying to look and see if it says how long it's good. I mean, I'm kind of assuming that you can't use these forever and that I will have to replace it, like it'll wear off at some point, but um, it's hard to know when you don't have any moths in the house, you know? But this is in my studio where yarn is, where um, wool is, all that stuff. So if I had a problem, we'd know. But I recommend them. And like I said, they're non-toxic, they're odorless. You would never even know it was there if you weren't like 
looking for it and it actually hangs behind some of you have noticed the wood stove in my studio which doesn't get used it hangs like behind that so it's out of the way but if there was one in my studio it'd be really easy for them to get to it so we'd know i don't know if this is katya or K katya um pizzetta at said might be a stupid question i don't believe in that she said can you spin that on a drop spindle love you trish i don't know of anything that you can't do on a drop spindle um that you can do on a wheel i can't think of anything there is a way to do all of it on a drop spindle I guess the only thing might be, the only limit might be if like the yarn is so thin that the spindle's too heavy to support it, if it's the drop style. Uh, I really don't know of anything. Maybe some of you guys know of something, but I don't know of anything that you can't learn to do on a drop spindle that you can do on a wheel. Gemma said I found it. Oh, she was looking for the the Horn Dorset Sox Drivaganza video. She said I found it thanks to the algorithm. For some reason it didn't come up when I searched or looked back through your videos. Did you ever get to the next four breeds you were thinking of testing? I haven't yet. I was kind of first waiting to get that Suffolk back from the mill and um, but it will happen. It's just a matter of being so busy right now and doing other stuff and getting taken in other directions and you guys know my attention span is like a goldfish so uh, wait they're known for the bad memory not the bad attention span. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what my attention span is like, but I will circle back to it and get to the other breeds. I'm going to do something very similar because we can't make a good comparison if I keep changing the testing means. Um, and I do have at least three breeds, probably four breeds in the house, figured out, plan to do as soon as I can. So I know some of you are probably like, oh my gosh, I won't even care by the time it comes out. but. You know, I'm just really following my path at the pace that it goes and that's been a battle for me at times just to follow my path instead of doing what people want or ask me to do and I have just found that when I'm doing things at other people's pace I end up not being happy. So um, yeah, we're trying to keep Trish happy. <laughs> and keep the content coming right that's the goal that's my goal it's probably not your goal Sophie asked the same question about a completely different video so probably a year and a half ago I did a video where I processed raw fleece I think it was Finn with very little to no tools some things were none some things were just like a flicker brush and she said can you use all these techniques on a drop drop spindle in my opinion yet yes you can so go for it. Caitlin had the next question. How wide were the fabric strips? This is on the rug that I just finished. You tore them, not cut. And how bad does the torn edge fray in the wash? When I was learning how to, I can't remember what the context was, but my mom taught me that when you're cut, I think it was for curtains. When you are cutting versus fabric versus tearing it, most of them will tear pretty straight down one thread. So you get this really straight um, tear, really straight edge, and it saves your fabric. It's good, it's actually good for fraying. It will fray, but I, as I go through, when I see the threads that are just like coming off, I just pull them off and throw them in the trash or throw them aside if I wanna like put them in a bat or who knows what. I mean, you can save them if they're something that you want. So I do pull off a certain amount of the fraying threads. And also I find when you, once you encase it is not the right word. Once you catch it all in the warp from your loom, it frays very little. I do believe that she's right about that being straighter and making better use of your material. I don't want you to think you have to rip them. You, you do not have to you could totally use a rotary cutter like um you could fold it accordion fold it and then use a rotary cutter but if you get even the slightest bit off the straight line of the fabric you will get like a wibble when you do that so that's why i rip it okay pat um said and asked love this been wanting to do this since your jeans video 
and I have a bag of like 30 old pairs of jeans I have got to do something with. How did I miss that you got a new loom? So this is your second floor loom. It is my second floor loom. I did say in that video that I was gonna sell the smaller one. However, I haven't posted it because I'm just really <laughs> having a hard time letting it go. The biggest thing that I believe is that it is so small and actually the front and the back will kind of close up. I don't wanna say it's a folding loom because it's not like you would want to fold it and open it all the time, but you could like fold it put it in a vehicle, take it somewhere for a weekend or even like an art fair or something, use it, and then it would be so easy to just take back home. Not so easy, it's not like, like again, it isn't something that just folds up and is meant to fold and unfold in five seconds, but you can transport it pretty simply. So I'm, I'm struggling, <laughs> that's why I haven't posted it. But yes, I have two now. You probably missed it because I wasn't really talking about it until I could get to it and you didn't miss much because I didn't talk about it much, but I love it. And one thing that I will say that I do like better about this loom and I didn't know that because it's my first floor loom is that this one has the friction break for holding the tension on the loom and the other one has a ratchet and paul and it's fine it works great like no problems but the friction brake is just the tiniest bit easier for me to use so i have found that i do like that a little bit better it's not a huge thing and it wouldn't stop me from buying another one if i found a great deal on one not that I'm trying to buy another one. <laughs> I don't have space. And I think also there is a part of my heart that dreams that someday I'm going to have a space that will allow me to have more than one loom um, warped and set up. Like I can't even have a rigid head loom set up at the same time. I could, but things start to get crowded really quickly. So I do dream about someday having space enough for a couple of looms plus my whole entire business <laughs> plus my spinning stuff i mean that is a tall order to fit into one space and i am super blessed with the space that i have right now but it isn't enough for a business multiple looms all my other hobbies i also have like a couple cutters a heat press i do sew i have to sew sometimes for the weaving but like i make dresses for that doll and um, I have an embroidery machine, so I have embroidered bags and towels and lots of things before. And most of them have paid for themselves or are paying for themselves, but you know, there's only so much room <laughs> to go around in a normal person's house. So I do kind of feel like as soon as I let go of that loom, I'm letting go of the dream that someday I'll have a studio that is that size. So, um, but I think someday it'll have to go. Danielle said, great project. I'm new okay shoot this is about the rug also I'm new to weaving so it feels like a silly question when you talk about hand hemming this project possibly what do you mean just doing a hem stitch across while the project is on the loom or something different entirely so a hem could be hem stitch but it could be a lot of different things so really a hem stitch on your weaving is just one way to hem your work it's it's a good lockdown type of stitch it is your hem sometimes but there are just like more ways to hem and i definitely wanted to take that edge and turn it under and then sew it down as my hem on the rug because i wanted that really nice tidy clean line some of you also asked about a picture in place i had for the thumbnail i had a picture in place of that rug but I bought something to make it so it won't slide. I'm gonna do a short on it and I'll make sure there's a good, good picture of it in place of that with that short. So that's coming too. Shell plays with string, same video, said great project and congratulations on the new loom. New tools are always fun even when space gets tight. When I'm weaving, I always struggle with how much I have done. What's the best way to keep track? I don't know the best way. I only know what I do. <laughs> So when I do it, I actually have showed this on a rigid heddle video, I'm not sure which one, but when I do need to measure length while I'm weaving, because for example, when I'm knitting the or weaving the dish towels, I like them to be 28 inches in length under tension. 
So that means when you let the tension off, they like, I don't want to shrink isn't the right word, but like they just kind of pull in a little because that it's they're not being pulled tight and Then when you wash them, they actually do shrink a little bit What I do is I will use some sort of pin. It might be a sewing pin I've used safety pins before I've used those little plastic safety pins that you can use for stitch markers when you're knitting sometimes and if I need to keep track of how many times I've moved my pin um example the dish dish towels so every seven inches i move my pin and the first time i put the pin in i just put in the pin if i use one of the safety pins the second time i put it in i hang another pin from it the third time i put it in i hang a third pin from it so i know exactly which time i moved the pin and then when i get to the end which is the fourth seven inch section i actually put a contrasting thread in and then i know to start measuring my next towel from there if i'm weaving let's just say I'm, those rainbow towels i would like suddenly put most of the backgrounds were light gray i would just suddenly put in a red string or some some bobbin that i had around that had a contrasting color so that when i go to cut them I can see exactly where I need to cut on each towel and I don't have to measure, I don't have to think about it, I know exactly where I'm supposed to cut. I did the same thing, I did 7 inches for that but I did 10 7 inch sections. I actually put up a post it and each time I moved my pin for that I just made a mark, a hash mark and just kept track. It's not a perfect science for me, I'm not great at it, I've seen people like wind um tape measures onto their beams and stuff i just feel like for me if i'm doing towels and i'm starting over and over again how it just doesn't seem like it makes sense for my brain so that's how i do it very low tech angela p said hi please tell me what warping mill you have are you pleased with it i have an ashford warping mill i really like it uh you know being me always wanting to warp a hugely long section there is like a little piece of my brain that says you really should have gotten one that you could do like a 20 yard warp on a 10 yard is a squeeze on that size warping mill but i do really like it i think it works really great um, i get a nice cross on it feel like you want to go more than 10 yards i think it's uh, it's perfect I couldn't ask for anything more except maybe that I could do a 20 yard one on it but you know that's ridiculous. Chris T said very beautiful could you explain how that warping tool works one day so she's talking about the mill I am actually going to do a separate short or series of shorts on how that works because I did not realize that that wasn't kind of like mainstream it is something that I think people think of only with the floor looms but you can totally wind a warp for a rigid heddle loom and that's actually my plan is to um, do a video or maybe a series of shorts winding a warp with it and then putting it on a rigid heddle loom so uh, that will be coming and I'll explain how it works it's really too much to put into this it needs to have its own video Chris thank you for the idea and I will definitely get it in the works get it in my hugely long list of ideas. <laughs> Becky Shook asked that it cost a lot when you fixed your electric wheel. Um, we just filmed that video so I'll be working on editing it and it'll go up as a bonus video in the next few weeks. It cost around $60. Hansen wanted to charge me $200 to fix it or to replace the motor and I think it was the motor, maybe it was the board. They wanted to charge me $200 with the price they quoted me and that would have, that I would have also had to pay for shipping there and back home. And um, John fixed it, replaced pretty much all the mechanics and the electronics for $60. Except my pedal, I think I have the same pedal. Steckelberg said, what is a sweater quantity can considered? How many ounces or six yards i'm not sure what the question was supposed to be but i think you're asking when i say sweater quantity what do i mean i think you're asking about fiber or maybe you're asking about yards it depends on what the weight of the yarn is what type of sweater you want like if you want a fisherman sweater that's full of cables you need way more yarn it just making all those cables takes tons of yarn 
Um, and if the person is bigger or taller, because their sleeves will need to be longer, their body of the sweater will need to be longer, that has an effect too. So if I'm buying fiber, I usually buy, if it's already washed, two pounds is sort of my lower limit. But John has a, um, a Jacob lamb sweater that I have weighed and I probably should do it on camera sometime. With the zipper, it's less than one pound. And it was spun long draw, so you end up getting more out of your amount of wool, like more yardage, and it's a light sweater. So um, it really just depends so on so many different factors, but I have found that two pounds can do almost any sweater that I would ever wanna do. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Gail. So this is fantastic and I'm so ready to try as soon as this, as the Ergo tool from the Woolery arrives. Okay, she's talking about that slaying, sorry, warping the loom with an already slayed reed video that I did with the second set of rainbow dish towels. And that is how I have warped my loom unless I did the sectional warping since then. It is so much easier for me. And then her question is, is this knot more closer to the front to back process since it starts first with the reed heddle then back? I would say it is a front to back. Did I say back to front? Or are you just trying to figure out what to call it? I, it is a, a front to back method, but I think it's very specific starting out with the slayed reed. And again, it makes so much sense to me because if you're not a weaver, having the reed slayed means that you have all your threads for your warp pulled through the reed and that's spaced exactly like you're going to weave them. So when you wind them onto your back beam, they're spaced out perfectly. And so it makes so much sense to my brain to start that way and use that as your spacer when you're winding. And I just love that way. I've used it like three or four times now. And for me, it has been so much simpler and nicer, better. The warps have turned out so much smoother and better using that method. But yes, I would say it's a front to back method. I don't know how to pronounce your name. I think you probably finished. Pelka um, voted on this. So I said this was coming later. This fleece is one that you all voted on in a TikTok or in a short on YouTube for me to spin next out of my stash. I've said before, like when you have washed fleece, sometimes it looks really crazy and I don't know, gross actually. But I had this bag full of fleece and I knew that there was more in my stash. So when this was the one who got the most votes, I went and pulled the whole entire bag out. I have two pounds of this, which works out very nicely if you were watching and listening before. So I'm picking it right now so I can run it through my drum carter. So this is the picked part. I have spun it before. I have some yarn and when we actually get to that video on this process, I show it. Um, it's really, really nice. And it is a Corydale, so she asks, what is the breed? It's a Corydale Romney Cross, I believe. I got it from a lady who just had like a hobby farm of sheep. She loves sheep, she didn't spin, she didn't know anyone who spun. She put her fleeces on Craigslist and I went and bought them like 10 years ago. I have spun some of this before, but not the whole fleece. And we are gonna finish this fleece and get it out of the closet. So I, that's why I'm picking right now while we're talking. Karen asked, Karen Page, do the live comments just vanish? So she's talking about the conversation that we have during the live. I don't really fully understand the process, but YouTube takes some time to process that before it shows up when you're watching the live. So if you come back later, um, you can like view the comments while the live is playing. And it's not actually, they don't show up as comments, it's like chat, so. Gemma said, number two, she voted for this. She said that crimp is, is just gorgeous. Do you have a project in mind or just wanna spin something? I don't really have a project in mind. I just wanna spin some of the yarn or some of the fleece out of my closet. I imagine it'll be a sweater or something sweater size. So like a poncho, shawl, something bigger. Um, also this crimp will make such a nice sweater yarn that it kind of makes me wanna do a sweater. 
I will maybe dye the yarn after or maybe blend it with some silk to make a tweed. I'm something I'm mulling over right now because I'm gonna have to card it. So if I wanted to blend it with some silk to make it tweedy, that's the perfect time to do that when it's running through the carter. So I'm trying to think about what I really wanna do with it right now while I pick, pick it and get it ready for carding. Elizabeth said number two, she also voted for this one. Isn't that the BFL you washed right before Tour de Fleece last summer? It, it's not BFL, so it can't be. I don't remember that fleece. I guess I have to go back and look in the videos because I don't remember a BFL. Sarah said, I love your wool adventure days. She's talking about the shearing day we went to. Do you have any favorites to recommend for a Michigander to visit? So I think that one is amazing. The farm is really inspiring. They have been doing what they're doing for quite a few years and they've been able to make it work, which is really cool. There are also some really cool mills in Michigan. There's one, um, Zylingers or Zylingers, I've heard it pronounced both ways, uh, is one in Frankenmuth. And then there is one here in Montague, Michigan. Uh, that's called Grand Alpaca. And I've had stuff processed there. There is Stonehenge. So there's quite a few in Michigan. So there's a lot of those to visit. And then Michigan Fiber Festival is magical place to visit. But those are some to think of, but I'm sure there's more. I'm really sorry if I missed you and you're in Michigan. Oh, there is a yarn store in my that's local to me too called Knit and Spin. I really feel like if you're ever in West Michigan, it's really worth a look. There is a really good yarn crawl, I think that is gonna happen in May this year. Uh, I don't know how many shops. Last time it was like 10 shops in West Michigan. So there's a lot. There's a lot of fiber fun things to do in Michigan and I'm in West Michigan. I bet you there's lots of fun ones on the other side, like in the Detroit area too. Okay, Sarah, same Sarah. I asked, is that a tennis elbow brace you're wearing? I was just diagnosed with that and spinning and knitting make it so much worse. Wondering if that's what you're wearing. Does it help? Do you have any recommendations? I did wear one for a while. I thought I had tennis elbow. Um, it turned out to be pain that was radiating from my shoulder because I've mentioned that I have some shoulder pain. I have not had it diagnosed. I'm not a, a good go to the doctor person. I think it's probably a rotator cuff issue. I've been working really hard on strengthening like all the muscles around it and stuff and it's helping but I do get pain that radiates all the way down my arm and into my forearm. That's what I was wearing that for. It's like the pain is like right on the top of my forearm and um, sometimes it's still aggravated and it did help. I'm not a doctor. Did it help me? It did seem to temporarily, but it didn't really seem to do anything long-term. So I think probably only your doctor can tell you how to fix it long-term, I'm sorry. Sue Warren said, hi, when you double warp your loom, do you also double your weft? I have tried it. I do not really like double weft very much, so I don't generally double my weft. Like if it's overshot, I will, but, um, I just really like how those come out when it's double warp and single weft. I think we all find those things and those ways that we like the fabric better and there's like no right and wrong. You just have to do it the way that you like it. Deborah asked on an old, old video, who won the drum carter? Someone is super happy. So Sherry from Texas, I believe she was in Texas, she's still comes to lives occasionally. She's in the Facebook group. Um, she won the drum carter. And <laughs> lately there's been a lot of ruckus about certain sellers announcing contests over and over and then never actually giving away the prizes that they promise. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there are threads on Reddit and in the G Demon Trolls um, consumer advocacy group in on Ravelry that talk about it. Um, <laughs> it happens a lot, I guess. I have never done that. If I held a contest, I've always given it away, sent it to who it's supposed to go to. Everyone has always received it as far as I know. And with bigger things, I do know for sure that people have always gotten the stuff that I promised in a giveaway. So anything I ever announced as a giveaway has 
been given away. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you are accusing me of that. I just know like right now there's a lot of talk about it in the community and I just want to, I mean, people will tell you here and in our Facebook group that they have received things many times. <laughs> Alice asked on a Paradise um, video, what do I do with the stickers? I hoard them. I have a Campbell's soup um, mug, you know, like a soup mug, and they all go into that unless I get a double and then I allow myself to use them. And I have this thing on the edge of that yarn shelf that's behind me a lot of times in a lot of videos on the end of it i put stickers that i get like in orders and things like that that are just the ones that i like or we buy them sometimes when we travel and so i do put them on that i only have a few on there right now but when i get a double for paradise i will use the double but i still hoard the original i literally just have a big pile of stickers valerie asked how did they get the sparkle in the fiber beautiful fiber this was last month's paradise package it was a gray i think it was a gray bfl um blended with a blue was it firestar or angelina i can't remember what the glitter fiber was but they do that during the carding they like blend it in with a machine so in their mill or in a mill i should say nancy skinner said have you tried tatting i have not my mom shuttle tatted when i was a kid and so i have seen it up pretty close um and i know you can get pretty quick uh, if you practice a lot but i have never tried it at all i mean i base i understand the basics of like how it works because of my mom doing it but no, I haven't tried it. Elizabeth Webb said, curious, could you, would weaving turn out, oh, okay. Would weaving turn out with same color patterning? She's talking about the samples that I did for, with knitting and crocheting of um, all those different ways of manipulating the color in your top. And it should be very similar to knitting, but the runs of color would be longer because instead of having the configuration when you knit that's like loops, which draws the color repeats to be shorter, you would have a straight line. So it would be very similar to the knitting, but the color repeats would be longer. It, I just felt like I didn't have time to also weave them all don't think it didn't cross my mind as <laughs> it did but i'm like time wise i just don't see how i can do that too apple song said i'm planning on purchasing a harrisville designs eight treadle loom in a few months so i'm doing a lot of weaving research right now how do you like yours i am loving it it's wonderful it's lovely i do not have a complaint I'm getting ready to warp the sectional warp beam for a long run of spring towels very soon. So uh, I'll film it, of course. Alice said, okay, so this is, um, I believe this is the same video. She said, on the chain ply, what speed and tension? I know, I know, just give me feel. Do you have it at? I can chain ply like a mad woman on the drop spindle but I still get so many breaks trying it on the electric eel wheel. I have the tension way low, speed medium low compared to the single, but still lots of, lots of breaks. I must be doing something wrong. So where is it breaking? If the single is snapping while you're pulling it off the bobbin to chain ply, but you're going kind of slowly, I would say you probably don't have enough twist in your single because you do need enough to hold it together for a reasonable amount of pulling to ply it if you're getting breaks after the plying like between your plying hands and the wheel I would say your tensions probably too high and maybe a combination of your tension and your speed being too high when I chain ply I actually have the tension on my wheel pretty high and I like the speed like medium high because I feel like it, if the tension is a little bit higher, it helps me keep it smoother and more even. So I do like the tension kind of high when I ply. The speed just kind of depends on how thick and how plied you want it to be, but also like how well your muscle memory is developed, how dexterous you are. So 
that's kind of a one of those factors without seeing you do it it's really hard to know for sure what's going on i mean if you want to film it and send it to me or put it in the facebook group or whatever we can maybe better troubleshoot um avril p said wow this is so interesting especially for a beginner if you were using the yarn for weaving would your preference change and why so she's asking i believe about the the spinning video again where i was manipulating the color i don't think it would change it, it really just depends on what you're trying to achieve so probably not much michelle atwell said i need your t-shirt where t-shirt where did you get it it was one of my matter root sheep t-shirts i will link their shop I have like four of them now. They just have the cutest, it's not always sheep, but they have the cutest sort of like botanically related shirts. They're really cute. And the lady is, that owns it is super, super nice. Okay, Tanya said, I'm liking, so this is love. What's the story behind my cousin Marie? So this is when I was dying some, um, some braids. My cousin Marie, I frequently name them after people that I know that the colors just remind me of. And the colors in that one remind me of one of my cousins. Her first name is Meredith. And I've already named a colorway after her that also reminds me of her. So I picked her middle name and um, used that one. So it's my cousin, Meredith Marie. Dilshani said, what size heddle are you using? Question is on the, okay, the question is on the rainbow dish towels. The first one I, the first set that I wove on the rigid heddle loom, I was using a 12.5 DPI heddle, but I double my warp. So each hole and each slot has two strands going through it. That's what I mean when I say I double it. Juanita Smith said, love this video. I'm doing a black and white one. She's talking about the buffalo plaid way back when I, um, when I did those pillows for the Christmas time buffalo plaid. Uh, do you cut your colors when switching or carry the yarn up the edge? So I used that project as practice to try and teach myself to carry them up the edge, but I don't, since then, have learned that I don't like carrying them up so many rows, uh, picks. I don't mind carrying them up if it's just a few picks. Uh, I was trying it out but i i have found that i i just don't like it that way michelle atwell asked is there a way to keep the lanolin when you wash a fleece the way that you get the lanolin out is by using very hot water so i have heard that you can use cooler water and it will melt off less but i am always shooting to remove it I don't care for it left in the fleece. I know some people like it, but I get rid of it all. Catherine Smith said, love the video. Now I want to try an electric spinning wheel. You may have said this before. Why would you choose an electric wheel over one power with your feet? They're way more portable. And some people have like range of motion or different kind of motion um, <sighs> difficulties that make it easier to use an electric wheel but also the speed is infinitely adjustable. So it does make it easier to do certain things on an electric wheel that are can be harder to do on a wheel that you have to treadle. Danielle said, congrats to the winner. I wonder if you did a doggy 23 and me on donkey. It would be interesting to hear what his mix is. We haven't, we've discussed it. I would say it's, it's definitely possible that we may do that with his vet um, because he had a heartworm we have done all his vet stuff through the rescue still that we got him from but he tested heartworm negative in february was it february whatever he tested heartworm negative recently finally and so he's going to be going and switching over to his like normal regular vet and we will discuss it with them if we're going to do it cindy said i just missed the live but watching sneakily when my boss isn't around i love your videos question when you get a small two ounce piece what do you make with it so it really depends on what it might be but if i don't know what to do with it and it's like super colorful a lot of times i will spin it up so that i can combine it and color work with something else but if it's something that i can spin very fine and still get enough 
if it's something I can spin very fine to stretch the yardage, I might do something lace, like a lace um, cowl or a smaller scarf or something like that. So you can do a lot. It really just depends on how you end up spinning it, if that makes sense. And it also depends a lot on the fiber. I like to let the fiber tell me like what it wants to be or what it needs to be. I usually do feel fine combining it with something else. Um, if it's a neutral, I can always combine it with something colorful, or if it's colorful, I can always just vice versa, combine it with something neutral, even something I bought from a shop. So I, I can find something to do with almost anything. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Alita said woven, oh, okay. This is on a woven dish towel video. Question, what brand, type, and weight of yarn? I can't seem to get this information, thank you. You know, I always think I put it in every single one, at least every single one that's more recent, but that could have been an older video. I'm not sure which video the question was on, but I use the 8-2 Maysville cotton from Great Northern Weaving for most of my weaving. I have found, well, for most of the towels, I have found that in the past, well since COVID, they have had a struggle getting certain colors in stock, but that is getting better. I was able to get some colors that I haven't been able to get for a long time pretty recently. And so that's wonderful. And that is my favorite. I have tried the Maurice Brassard. I don't like it as much because it was super linty. Cotton's gonna give off some lint. You know, that's just the way it is. And then I've tried the, the Webs has one. Uh, Valley Yarns makes an 8-2 cotton. That one's okay too. Uh, I don't dislike it. I feel like I just don't quite like it as much. But for a while I was able to get colors that I couldn't get from Great Northern. I'm so obsessed. Mama and Morgan Kilkenny asked, any tips if you want to spin woolen from a purchase fleece that has VM in it, do you comb it first? I use a flicker brush if there is VM in the locks, and I have a video on this. I will link it below. Patty K said, if you dye your carded roving, how do you dye it? Is it different from commercial? I don't, I have before um, dyed stuff that I carded first. I've dyed bats directly and I've dyed roving. There really isn't anything wrong with it with doing it but what i have found is when i do it i end up having to cart it again because it gets like compacted during the process i really just don't do it anymore because of that for that reason if i have to cart it again anyways i might as well just dye the locks and then card them and be done you know just would take one step out um she said it's a different from commercial it, it's definitely different Although most of what people buy commercially is actually top, so it's combed. So if I dyed commercial actual roving, have I ever done that? I don't think I have, but I do have some commercial roving in with inventory. So maybe I'll try it. Starry Nights said, could you do a tutorial on how you acid dye your rovings? I would love an in-depth close up on your process. I have been intending to do that for ages. Yes, I will do it. I just can't say when. Again, I have so many things going at the same time, but I've been intending to do it for ages. It's coming. I think more in-depth classes on a few different things are coming. And I have come to understand that it's fine for me to be a person who is just I'm, if things work for me, I'm okay with it. And if you don't want to do them my way, I'm okay with that too. Like I'm totally fine with it. But some people get so hung up on what they see as the only correct way to do things that there have been times when I just haven't wanted to do classes for that reason. But I think I'm just getting more and more okay with doing that. Joanne Ross said, I have enjoyed watching the creation of colorways. However, how do you cook your wool? Can you show or have you shown this part of the operation? How do you get your roving to be fluffy afterwards? Okay, so first of all, it's top. It is not roving. Right now, what I'm using is uh, induction burners because I don't have a regular stove in my studio. I have not 
I, there was a real learning curve for me with the induction burners and I'm still trying to get there to where I feel just super like I have this down, I know exactly what, how I want it and what I want it to do. Um, but right now I'm using induction burners with stainless steel pans and it's working okay. I think that I'm, I'm definitely close to feeling like it's perfection, but not quite there yet. And it has been a process for me to get used to that. I used to cook them all on a gas stove at home, so I had a more controllable temperature heat source. Um, I'm just learning. Okay. Alice said, some of the ways you add color and patterns, etc., come with practice. Do you just know how it will play out in the fiber in your head? So a lot of times I do, but I still get surprised sometimes. You know, John surprises me sometimes because he will do things that I would not do. And it doesn't mean they're wrong. It means that my brain thinks that I know the outcome and that I won't like it. And then he does it and I'm like, you know what? I really think that's cool. So working with him that way has been super good for my brain because I learn a lot from what he's doing. I watch what outcomes he gets based on his um, techniques all the time because I'm always trying to learn to be better and I just learn a lot from watching someone who doesn't have any preconceived notions a lot of times about how things are going to come out. I mean he has learned some things about color theory and has really taken them on board so that's helped him obtain the results he wants more often but it's been really helpful for me to see him experimenting and trying his own techniques and stuff. Um, Kate asked about the, the woven scarf I did with the black, the toil and trouble roving. She said, love this, thanks for sharing it. Were you carrying the different yarns up the sides or cutting and weaving in ends all the time? Um, I used three different yarns for that. If you remember, if you wanna go back and look, I was carrying because visually it's pretty disorganized and I didn't think it was going to be noticeable because there's like so many different textures and stuff and it's not noticeable at all. But I, if it is something that is visually more orderly, I will hesitate to carry them as much as I used to or as much as I really want to. Like I really want to be able to do that and make it look super great but sometimes I just can't get it to look as nice as I want it to. Lori uh, Coulter it's a great tip about using a wider set to let the texture of the art yarn show more. Have you ever adjusted your set by skipping slots holes or would that make the spacing too wonky? Just thinking about how to accomplish the same effect with the equipment I already have ten dent heddle. So I have done that. I did that on the denim rug. Well, it's not always a bad thing to have your spacing be uneven. And with an art yarn, that could add kind of like another layer of texture change that could be super cool. The only thing that I would say is that you do keep in mind that you still need to alternate a hole and a slot because if you have two slots that are next to each other, you get two going the same way. I mean, you don't have to, you still can do it that way if you want to change the spacing up, but it's going to change how long your floats are. So you do have to kind of keep that part in mind, but yes, I have done it. The other thing that I can see maybe being an issue is that the smaller the heddles get on your rigid heddle loom, like the closer the set is, the smaller the holes in the slots get. So if you're trying to use a thicker yarn, like in a tendon, just for example, heddle, and you're trying to go every other, you might get some abrasion because the spacing is just smaller and so your heddles are like held together and smaller, tight, more tightly. So you might get some abrasion. So it is something to think about if you wanna to try to use a smaller heddle and then go every other and get a wider set. Kathia or Katya, had another comment she said gorgeous Trish I love it too by the way I know you are not a fan of the idea but how about putting up a patreon account you don't need to say 
anything nor ask just put it out there and if someone wants to join they'll join if not they won't just think about it love you so this was two months ago cat i you i think you're probably newer and the only reason i think that is because <laughs> this was like a turmoil for me the end of last summer and in the fall so i did not want to set up another platform i still feel really strongly about that particular issue i think we are all visiting spending time on probably more platforms than we want to a lot of the time and so what i ended up going with is a membership on youtube so for people who want to support me in that way or support my path my journey our community in that way it's i think it's set up for just one membership level you're either a member or you are not and right now it's strictly just for those who say like hey i want to throw a couple bucks towards supporting this journey every month. I turned it on before I was ready, did not really know what I was doing. Then there was like some ruckus about it. So it exists. You can join whenever you want, you can leave whenever you want, but this keeps it on YouTube. So there's not yet another platform that you end up like joining, visiting, signing up to all those things. You would just keep it right on YouTube. There's other ways to support though, uh, so many of you do just watching the videos really helps watching them all the way through helps every single time you leave a comment every single time you hit like every single time you share it somewhere even if you just copy the link to share it somewhere and then don't share it that helps <laughs> I mean I never think I'm gonna have a million subscribers but to be honest when I was first starting out I told John like if I get to 3,000 it will be miraculous and we're past 14,000 right now so and also I think for this community it's not going to be for everybody I'm certainly not for everybody some people cannot stand me and they never have a problem telling me in the comments <laughs> I'm not saying things couldn't change in the future maybe something will happen someday but right now that's where we are and it does give people who want to support in that way the option to do it and they don't have to go to a separate platform so I think that's really nice okay wait I have to go back. Joanne asked how I get things fluffy after I dye them. So I've showed you this before. After I dye it, when it's completely dry, I kind of gather it up into like, like three long loops and I grab it close to the ends and I shake it like this. <laughs> That's what I do. It opens the fiber up just enough to make it fluffy. I cannot remember who asked the question, but I pulled this out and I haven't seen it one of you said i really wanted to see the sweater yarn for your son from the last video so i thought i would bring it and show you and tell you the situation i love it i love it but it isn't as dark as he wanted it to be and so i was like well i'm not over dying this because i love it i don't want to change it so i ordered him commercial yarn and then this i'm going to keep for a sweater for either me or john prop john just said i would like a sweater out of that so it'll probably go to john but i'm th super thrilled with how that color came out it's really nice and it has like some variation you can see it has some tonal um changes to it so what i'll do is while i'm knitting the sweater i'll take like two hanks at a time so that I'm always working with two different hanks and that will help even it all out. Okay, last question for real. Susie Susieisms said, I have a question. After dyeing, spinning, and washing and thwacking the yarn will shrink further after knitting. I'm knitting up my first sweater with homespun Corydale top. If I hand wash and flat dry, will the sweater shrink after all these processes? If you've done all that, it should not shrink more if you hand wash in cold and then just like lay it out in the shape that you want and let it dry. It shouldn't shrink more. But I honestly think you're probably at more risk of it growing a little bit if you block too hard. So be careful with the blocking um, and enjoy your hand spun sweater. That's really exciting that you're knitting your first hand spun sweater. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. For hanging out with me today while I pick this fleece. I still have probably more than half of it to go so I've got to get going on it. I don't think you all really could possibly know how much I love and appreciate you, how much you have been there for me and um, hopefully I've made your life better too. I just 
I can't say it enough. I appreciate you all so much. So I hope you have a great week. I will see you Sunday for the live. And I guess that's it. Thanks. I love you. Bye.